our next time space visualizer feature um, playwright, actor, director, and Davros. I'd like to welcome David Goodison. How are you, David? Fine, thank you. Yes, thanks. excellent. Thanks very much for joining us um, today for our Time Space Visualizer event. Um, I hope that you're um, staying safe and well in these um, challenging times. Yes, yes, we are. Yes, we are indeed. We're missing seeing our children and grandchildren, you know. But, but I mean, I'm, I'm lucky because I'm a writer as well, as you mentioned. And um, this is a very good opportunity to get on with the play that I'm writing. So I'm lucky in the sense I've got an occupation which is right here. <laughs> so making good progress then by the sounds of that. It's reasonable progress, yes, indeed. And I've got no excuses not to do it now. And can you tell us a little bit about what you are writing at the moment? Well, I'd rather not, if you don't mind, only because I'm, because I do the other things, as you mentioned as well, I'm an actor as well. The plays take a, a long time to, to gestate and they're based on research and they tend to change as they go along and, and you might well be bored by the time I get to finish it. So it'll be a nice surprise, hopefully, when it's finished. Well, we'll look forward to that for sure. Um, I, I, I sat down and, and, and did a little bit of research this afternoon um, and I was surprised to, to, to see that um, you'd studied law and English at Cambridge. Yes. Um, but had sort of drifted into the Cambridge footlights by the feel of it. How did, how did that all come about for you? Um, the Cambridge footlights. Well, I mean, while, while I was at Cambridge, I did a huge amount of different things. I mean, I was, I did a lot of legit sort of theater, um, you know, Shakespeare's and so on. And, and so on, but but I loved sort of jokey uh, musical mu sort of music and review really. And uh, you know the foot like, we did we did shows in the college that I was in, the Queen's College. Um, and then there was a natural movement to the Cambridge Footlights, which was the sort of you know the senior club as it were. And I got there that I met some these lovely people like Graham Garden and, and, and Tim, God, sadly who died this last week, um, and 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 Eric and, and Eric Idle and people, and and so much enjoyed my time with them that it rather superseded the sort of all the all the kind of you know the, the heavy stuff that I've been doing because I just love doing it um, but I wasn't interestingly I wasn't a I'm not a writer I'm, well I am a writer I'm a playwright but I don't write sketches I was never been a comedy writer so I was there really as a comedy actor um, you know playing uh, strange little parts or strange parts in, in the sketches and so on um, and I thoroughly enjoyed that and and you know, from there, I suppose it, it took a direction because you studied law, English, all the all the important, all the stuffy stuff, if you like. But then I'm assuming that just sort of took you in the direction that you sort of ended up in. Not really, not 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 a straight line. <laughs> no, no, rather odd curve. Because the thing was, because um, I I I just read English. Um, I did a what they call it, a certificate of education, a PGCE, because I thought that. I, what I want to do is to definitely, I know I want to teach, but I wasn't sure, as I said, because I wasn't a, a writer, I wasn't really the same sort of, I wasn't a comedian. I was a comedic com actor who ended up in the footlights rather than, you know, someone like Graham is a brilliant writer and, and John Cleese, obviously a wonderful writer as well as a performer. So I thought, well, that's not really the path for me. So I, I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do know I want to teach. So I went off teaching and it was while I was teaching that I thought, I've got to get into, I've got to give this business a go. And so I then went into repertory theatre where I did, you know, musicals and reviews and also <clears throat> a lot of straight things as well and became an actor, basically. I didn't go to drama school, but I went straight in from, from the school I was teaching in, actually. And I was that rep in Salisbury? Yeah, in Salisbury, absolutely, yes. Ten pounds a week. <laughs> and it, did I read right? Stephanie Cole was in one of the um, early reps. She was, she was in that same company. We performed together in the pantomime and I also directed her in the first play that I directed at Salisbury, the Playboy of the Western World. And she's been, you know, a good, good friend ever since. And um, so you, you sort of drifted, I'm assuming, between um, theatre and then, then television opened up in, yeah. in, in the sort of mid-60s, mid I suppose. Um, right. Were you using television as a way of supplementing theatre or was it just, any, were you just looking for any opportunity to be creative? Um, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, what is what it's sort of like, I think it was, I think it was the great, um, um, you know, Patrick Troutman who said, well, I'm a letterbox actor. I do what comes in through the letterbox. <laughs> it's a brilliant book. And I think that's what I was, you know, the telly came up and the telly, and it was a good part. The first one I did was a really nice part. And so I, you know, took it with, with open hands as it were, and really loved it. Yeah. And I, and I suddenly, I love telly because I quite like, 
the intimate thing, you know, of course, Davros isn't intimate to the slightest bit, but I enjoyed, well, I enjoyed both sides. I enjoyed the big stage and, and the sort of, and the, and the big characters, but I also think it's lovely to be as natural as you can be on telly and, and sort of where they're picking up all these tiny expressions and, and, and intimate and, and, and sort of subtle details. So I love that. I'm definitely the, um, the sort of 60s, 70s sort of era of television, you know, multi-camera, cameras quite close up, you, you could certainly put expression um, into the acting, particularly. Yeah, sure. Um, and then um, I'm going to fast forward because obviously um, we're, we're here to talk about Doctor Who and um, the opportunity came up. Um, how were you cast as Davros? That is so strange. Um, I just got a call from my agent who said they want you for Doctor Who. And they said it's a good part. And I thought, well, that sounds good. And it's the character of Davros. I thought, Davros? First of all, I thought, does it sound like some Greek dancer? I thought, um, and I, I didn't know my Doctor Who very well, so I didn't know who it quite was, but it was a good part. And they didn't want to interview me. They didn't want to see me. They just said, it's an offer, and here it is, it's yours. And I took it, and I, and I later discovered why they went for me. Um, it's because the Ken Greaves, the director, said, basically, Davros, he saw it as a radio part because it's just the voice, which is an odd thing in some ways. And because I was a very experienced radio actor, I'd gone from television into radio and I'd done over 200 broadcasts. I was a very experienced radio actor and I also was rather the same height and shape as Michael Wisher. So I fitted the costume. So with a BBC economy, <laughs> it was absolutely, you know, thought this is just the ideal match. So that's how I got into it. Had you been aware of Doctor Who? Um, aware of it. Things that, you know, tea time in the 60s, I remember you know, William Hartnell starting off and it was terrific and, and we all, we watched it. But then of course in the 70s, when, you, when you're when you starting to work and do other things, then, then I'd sort of knew it was going on, but I hadn't sort of particularly followed it. Um, but was delighted to be, to be uh, you know, in, in it as it were. So you, you, you'd obviously been made aware that Michael Wisher had played the, the, the part of Davros or created the part of Davros, I suppose, um, in 1975. Um, yeah. uh, did you look back at tapes? Did you just go in and, and take this role and make it your own? How, how, how did you approach it? It was very clear. The instructions were very clear. You can be as much as like, like Michael as you can be. So we, we listened to watch the tapes, listened to the voice and, and tried to you know to replicate his performance because often when you're taking over something they want you to put something of yourself into it and here they didn't say don't put something but i mean it was very much be like michael wisher but of course the script was completely different from the michael wisher script in 1975 because davros in this episode was much more vulnerable being pushed around and offered jelly babies and things like that by mr baker um, you know uh, so the, the part became different because of the sort of script really so it was a different angle on davros and though that wasn't particularly the, the brief, if it was, it were. And, and of course, you've already, you've already mentioned about the costume, but the, um, the actual Davros costume, uh, understand the budget was a little bit tight. So yeah. therefore, it was a reuse of the costume. Um, yeah. And I understand that the mask fitting was a little bit of a challenge. Absolutely. Yes, it really was, because it was the same mask and it had been out on, because again, they, they never sort of thought they'd do anything ever again. You know, they didn't sort of keep anything. So they'd used it. They put it out on, on, on an exhibition. So they had to bring it back from the exhibition and then they had to sort of redo it. And I think you can always tell which mine is because there was a little bit of sort of around the mouth. If you look at my, my Davros, there's a bit there, a bit sort of some, some repair work. And I always think it's, it's as if Davros has been eating a Mars bar and that was really not terribly successfully. Uh, whereas Mr. Wishers is straight, very clean. And, uh, ah, I mean, I, I look at the Dalek props, actually, and I'm, I'm, more, I'm, more, I'm more tuned into the fact that the Dalek props are a little bit more beaten up in Destiny of the Daleks than the Davros costume. So I don't really notice it particularly. Um, so you, you sort of took the fitting and then, of course, out comes all the rest of the, of the, of the whole costume. How, how difficult was it to sort of manoeuvre and, 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 and sort of be Davros when you were in studio? That was tricky, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, only because, you know, you, 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 there's the technical problem. First of all, the technical problem of, of getting the, the voice through a mask which means that in the rehearsal room, what I'd been doing in the rehearsal room was fine. And then suddenly we got on the set and it was not enough. So I had to sort of treble the volume and treble the intensity because it's got to fight its way through a great lump of latex. But also moving that thing around, you know, the, 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 what Terry Malloy calls the shopping trolley, the sort of mad shopping trolley with your bottom and, and, your, and your feet is, was really tricky. 
while trying to look as if you're running the universe. <laughs> and sort of say, not, it's like the swan, really. It's very serene above, but paddly like hell underneath. Yeah. Yes. It's always, always a little bit of a challenge. And um, uh, uh, avoiding the scenery, obviously, a little bit of a challenge as well. well yes, absolutely. Steering, because again, you can't see much out of this mask. It was, you know, not quite blind, but you, you could see a little bit through some gauze, but only just a tiny, a little bit, sort of like straight ahead, but not to the side. Yeah. And um, what was, you, obviously you're coming into an established cast and obviously you, you, you're sort of coming up against the tour de force that is Tom Baker. It was Lull Award's first story in Doctor Who, the beginning of season 17. Um, what was the feeling like on set? Was it, was, it, was it a good atmosphere? Did you get on well with Tom? Very well with Tom, yes. And the lovely thing was that in those days, um, it was still the old fashioned way of doing telly, which was a bit like theatre. So you rehearsed in a room, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Acton Hilton uh, for 10 days before you ever went near the set. And that was brilliant, actually, because, you know, we got to know each other and you had laughs and jokes and, and, it, and you, so we got to know them. And then when you get on the set, you kind of, you're already, you're already a little company, a team, um, and particularly not knowing anyone, and, and it was, that was great. And it was a very good way of doing it. And, and had you worked with Ken Grieve before? No, I hadn't, which again was surprising when he offers you a job and he doesn't know you. <laughs> he didn't know me from Adam. Well, he mean, didn't knew me from Adam, but, but, <laughs> but I didn't know. How was it? Uh, it's an interesting question, I, I, I think, and maybe, maybe you, you uh, I don't know how you can answer this one particularly, but how hard is it as a director to go into a, I'm sure if you're a director yourself, to go into a, a piece like Doctor Who and be directed by somebody else. Are you comfortable with that? Y yes, I think so. I mean, that is, you, from, you mean from the point of view of the director or the actor? Yeah, the point the, of view of you being, I suppose, an actor, but actually being a director in your own right and being directed by somebody else. Well, I think you've just got to sort of separate, separation of powers, you know, I mean, you know, you, when you go in as an actor, and also as you go in an actor, you, you, look, you expect to be directed. And, and he was brilliant, actually, because he was, very such a lovely man and 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 he created this very nice atmosphere and and i think was technically extremely good um you know we didn't we weren't really aware of that but shooting low so that so that it looks you know using that small budget to huge to hugely good effect to make it more creepy when it was creepy um so he and he, he was just a delight and i met him again i hadn't i didn't i didn't meet him again until the we did the um, the dvd um uh, and so that was lovely to see him again um, and I, I, I don't think it'll be too long before we hopefully see the story um, coming out on, on Blu-ray box set. They're re-releasing all the, all the seasons of Doctor Who now. So it won't be too long, I'm sure, before you'll be hopefully back in front of a camera and, and doing another um, revisit of the story. How does, uh, yes, on Blue, yes I, that will be exciting. It'd be nice to see that, yeah. They're coming up for sure. Um, again, another one that stood out in my, um, in my research, actually, and moving away just briefly from Doctor Who, um, I remember this series actually from growing up. Um, you, you did a couple of seasons of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a children's TV program, I think, called Sea View, which was, which was set in Blackpool, um, opposite um, Yvette Fielding. What are your memories of that story, of that um, filming? Well, that was, that was, again, fun. I mean, that's what my whole career has been doing different things, really. And it couldn't be much more different from Davros. You know, I was just sort of trying to run this hotel. <laughs> and it was quite funny because I'm the least practical person on this earth. And, and I was doing all this. I was this sort of Mr. Man in the kitchen. And I was, and a friend said, you would know, you know, a friend who was a carpenter said, look, the way you put that, you would know carpenter would ever do what you would do with the hammer and nails. <laughs> so I was found out by somebody. But I, I mean, I loved and of course, because I taught in Yorkshire, that's when I did when I taught. I was able to do the the accent, and it was quite, quite nice to be with Maggie, who was you know genuine Lancastrian and Yvette, of course. They were all genuine, and I except for me. Um, and I was quite flattered afterwards when I got a, apparently my agent got a call from Coronation Street. <laughs> so I thought I must have done it okay. But then, very um, perhaps too honestly, she said, "No, he lives in London," and the phone. Straight put down. <laughs> no, he's a Londoner. No, they thought no. So, so that's why I didn't get into Coronation Street. Oh, a stint in Corrie would have, wouldn't have, wouldn't have gone down too too bad, I'm sure. <laughs> well, anyway, that was. <laughs> but it just tickled me, actually. Sorry, I, I, I'm indulging myself to a degree because actually I remember the series as um, as I as I grew up. Um, and then um, 14 years in Touch of Frost, opposite um, David Jason. 
yes, that was again another another you know interesting experience, <laughs> uh, very different, and um, playing this sort of it was quite nice. This this sort of supercilious under um, not undertaker, sorry, um, um, pathologist um, you know, who's, who's the only person on set who really tells Mr. Jason where, 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 she, where he should be going. <laughs> um, we had a lot of fun. I mean, because I'd worked with David before, actually again with BBC Radio, we'd done a comedy series together called The, the Next Programme that follows almost immediately, 1970, one and two. So I knew him and, and it was very nice to work with him again. Um, the, the locations were not attractive. This mortuary early in the freezing up mortuary early in the morning was not a sort of fun place to be. You've not got an awful lot to work with there. Pathology is a, a very one, a one dimensional situation. You've, you've, yeah. You're going to be in amongst a lot of dead bodies there, I feel. Yes, no, it was, it was interesting, odd, but, but um, well, fun in a way. <laughs> uh, of course, yes. I mean, always nice, though, to, um, to get involved in a, in a sort of a longer running um, TV yeah. programme like that, of yeah. course. And it means that you have the chance to develop a character because often that, that, that the one-offs, a lot of one-offs, and you don't really get a chance to develop the character, but on that, I could. Yeah. Um, and are lots of theatre then going on in between that. Do you have a particular um, standout over, over your career of, of, of something that really stands out that, you, that you've, I suppose, have a lot of love for now um, that, you, that you've been involved in? Well, I think particularly one thing I'm thinking of is that I had a wonderful season in Regent's Park in the open air theatre where I played Peter Quince, who's the leader of the mechanicals, if you, if you know, or it's someone on stream. And the, the bottom was the great Roy Hudd. Um, and I've just been thinking about him because he sadly passed away. But that was the most wonderful experience working with him. Again, I'd worked with him on radio, in radio comedy. But to sort of, he's a fine actor as well as, as we know, as, as well as a comic. And it was just brilliant. That being part of that team with him um, and that very successful summer. We had a wonderful summer. Um, and we didn't, we were playing from May right the way through to September. And it was, that was a, a joyous experience. And, and the whole team worked very well. And he was a brilliant lead of the team, but also that, you know, a, a very generous man as well. And, and that was a, a standout time. And, 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 you know, everybody you talk to about Roy Hurd, um, a, a generous character, um, a, a larger than life character for sure. And again, another, another sad passing of somebody who, you know, another talent, I think. We've had, we've had far too many, I think, recently. Yes. Okay, so um, one final question. Um, what's next for you when we come out of lockdown i'm assuming going back to the very start the, the piece that you're working on right now could be something that would be developed and and that will be potentially your next project as you come come out of lockdown very much will yes and you and you suddenly start thinking with the way things are now whether whether there's some way we can film this <laughs> you know i mean because it's never occurred it's a theater piece but but it, you, know, you suddenly think well maybe we shall We'll all get into a small room and <laughs> with a camera and make it happen that way, you know. Um, it's, um, it's interesting actually because obviously theatres and 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 cinemas and everything now closed and, and likely to be for the rest of the year. Um, I'm really enjoying the opportunity to see some of the national theatre and um, some some of the musical performances on 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 YouTube. Um, do you particularly have a view on 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 live theatre being screened into cinemas and, and being made available like this? Well, I think it's a great idea actually. No, because we saw one, we saw the Jane Eyre the other, the other week from the National Winter. That was terrific, wasn't it? It was and beautiful. Brilliantly. Um, because they, they sort of combined the best of the theatre and then with the close-ups, which of course you can't get. <laughs> you know, it's your, um, and they did actually, my, the last play I, I wrote and they did, we did a tour of it. And when it was at the Travis Theatre, they, they filmed that and streamed that. Um, and that was that was quite effective. It wasn't quite as well done as they did at the National, but it was pretty well done. And it was it did work very well. And it went to because it was only a short run. They took it to the people who couldn't get to the show on those two two nights. But but it, it is a very effective way of, of getting a stage play, you know, onto a screen. I think it, it really works. Some of the actors, I think, find it a little bit. Um obtrusive a little bit sort of too it, uh, it blocks the freedom a little bit but for me I prefer the camera to be close up so I'm seeing um, something as I would see it if I were in the theatre. Yes. yes I agree I mean I've never been involved in one myself um, so I don't know what it feels like to be on, the, on that side as it were but um, no, no I think you're right. 
So hopefully we'll be spoiled a little bit more um, with, with some more presentations from the National Theatre and, and, and YouTube and all the magical, mu the musical mag uh, magics that we we're getting coming through. Um, we're out of time. It's, it's been lovely to um, catch up with you, um, David. Uh, it, it's, it, we couldn't do justice. Hopefully we'll get you to a phantom event uh, in, in the live. Um, once we can, once we can get back on the road and, and do our events um, on, on, you know, our weekend events, but hopefully I'll see you soon and, and catch up with you there. Um, absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Um, David, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Okay.